good singing. While you remain standing, if you go ahead and take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter number 3. Daniel chapter number 3, we're continuing our study in the book of Daniel here on Sunday uh, evenings in our church. And uh, we're going to pick up our reading in verse number 19 and go ahead and, and read on down to finish the chapter here uh, in verse number 30. We're talking about that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego once again. Uh, we see them in chapter 3 as the nonconformists. That's what we're calling them. They're the nonconformists. Nebuchadnezzar is trying to get them to conform uh, to the things of Babylon, but they're not going to do that. And uh, last week we looked at the testimony of the nonconformist. Uh, tonight, the triumph of the nonconformist uh, here in Daniel chapter 3. And so let's begin in verse number 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heard uh, heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their heads singed, Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen. Well, let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the word of God this evening. And we ask now that you would uh, teach us through the preaching of your word and by the presence of your Holy Spirit, draw us closer to yourself that we can know you more, that we can be better equipped to serve you. We pray as always for souls to be saved and for lives to be changed and for revival to come. We we'll thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. We humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Here in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fiery furnace, of course, this is a very familiar story. Probably all of us that have uh, had been in church, maybe when we were young people, maybe when we were in children, you know, this would be one of the classic uh, children's stories. Lots of times that are told, they're in the uh, the Bible story books and things, and uh, so very common uh, um, account that we know about here in Daniel chapter number three. And it is a wonderful thing uh, to think that these three would be cast into that fiery furnace that the son of God uh, that it, that's what Nebuchadnezzar called him anyway said I see a fourth man looks like the son of God well I just believe he got that right I believe it was the son of God amen I really believe that it was Jesus in what we refer to as a Christophany or an Old Testament appearance uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth 
I think it was Jesus that was walking around in that fire uh, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And of course, the fire didn't harm them at all. Uh, the Lord took care of them. But they were cast into the fire because of their nonconformity. Remember, that's what we're calling them here in Daniel chapter 3, the nonconformist. Cast into the fire because of their nonconformity, but the fire had no power over them. Now you remember the setting of this uh, in the beginning of the chapter that ne uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king in Babylon, he made an image of gold. And he made this image of gold really to be an image of himself and, and uh, of his rulership, you know, there in that kingdom. But, it, but he also made a decree that whenever the music was played, and the Bible gives a list of various instruments and so forth. And so all the people were told that when you hear that music, when you hear the band uh, start playing, that they were to bow down and, uh, and worship that golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. And whoever would not do so would be cast into the fiery furnace. And so uh, it had already been laid out. The consequences were well known uh, to everyone. And, and these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew the decree. They knew what they were told to do when they would hear the music. And uh, they knew what the consequences would be if they would not uh, uh, bow down to uh, this image. But these nonconformists, they refused to bow. And uh, they refused to uh, follow this decree, this order uh, of the king. And as we saw in their testimony uh, last week, they said back in verse number 18 uh, of the text, well, I backed up to verse number 17. In verse 17, uh, they're speaking and they say, if, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, o, o king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And as we said before, they were in Babylon, but they were not of Babylon. Amen. And they would refuse to do such a thing because, you see, they knew the Bible. They knew the Old Testament scriptures. They knew the Ten Commandments. They knew that God had already said that, uh, that thou shalt not have any other gods before me. They knew that God had already said that he was a jealous God and that they were not to, uh, in any means to bow down to some image uh, of anything that upon the earth, anything having to do with man or the creation itself. They were not to bow down to any idol or any image such as this. They just knew the word of God and they just believed God's word and they just believed that, that God would deliver them, that, that God would handle this. But they told the king, said, look, if not, if we burn up in that fiery furnace, just, just so you'll know, we're still not going to bow down. Uh, we're not going to disobey our God or disobey his word. And I think they had faith all along uh, that God would deliver them through it all. I, I think they believed what we have today in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Now, they didn't have this verse uh, written at that time. But I believe they had the principle and they had the application of it in their hearts. As Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Uh, they weren't worried about it at all. They believed that God would work it out to be good in whatever way that he would choose for it to be. And, and so uh, that verse there, again, Romans 8 28, uh, all things, we know all things work together for good to them that love God and then to them who are the called according to his purpose. I think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had a sense of that calling. They, had, they understood that they were the called according to God's purpose. As we said, in Babylon, but not of Babylon, but they were in Babylon as witnesses uh, of, of the God of Israel. And, uh, and they knew that. They knew that they had a purpose for their life. And so what we see here, I think that we can apply to ourselves, uh, are three things. That according to God's purpose, they had this. And according to God's purpose in Jesus Christ, we can have these things as well. And so notice three of them with me, uh, three thoughts with me this evening. First of all, according to God's purpose, uh, they had a new sense of freedom. A new sense of freedom. 
If you'll notice back with me in the verses, verse 22, and reading down through verse 25 again, it says, Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt, uh, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And so according to God's purpose for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they found in the furnace of fire itself a new sense of freedom. They had liberty, you see, to walk around in the furnace. Can you just imagine that and picture it in your mind? They're walking in the midst of the fire. They threw them in, they're bound, but in the fire, they're loose. And, and they're loose in the presence of the Lord because there's a fourth man walking uh, in that fire uh, with them. Nebuchadnezzar said he looks like uh, the Son of God and we can believe that he was indeed uh, the Son of God. But they had a new freedom. Because you see, they were walking around in that furnace. They were not saved from the fire, but they were saved in the fire. Amen. And that application is made to us through our salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, we're not, we're not saved from this world, but we are saved in this world. And the Bible tells us that in this world, we're still going to have tribulation. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to have trials. We're going to have uh, hard times. But, but through the salvation we have in Jesus Christ, we, like Shadrach and, and Meshach and Abednego, we can just know the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Amen. And we can walk around loose in the fire. And we got a fourth man walking with us. we got the Son of God himself walking right with us through it all. And so what you have here is an indestructible principle. Uh, beyond the reach of any fiery trial. We see it, uh, the example of it, with these three here in Daniel chapter number three and in that fiery furnace there uh, in Babylon. And we understand the principle in Romans chapter eight, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You see, we know it's going to happen. Can you say amen to that? We know that it's going to be good. That's the principle. And so you see, what it is, is a new sense of freedom. You know, so many people think that, well, if, you, if you're going to be a Christian, then, then you lose all your freedom. You can't do the things that, that you uh, want to do. You can do everything you want to do. But the thing about it is, when you become a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's just things you don't want to do anymore. Amen. You don't want to do those old sins anymore. You don't want to live that old lifestyle anymore. You're a new creature. As 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's lots of things that you and I could do, but, but saved by grace, our lives changed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the presence of His Holy Spirit. We just don't want to do those things anymore. Amen. We want to do the things where we can walk with the Lord and we can serve Him. And so you see, that's really a freedom. Uh, being a Christian is not, is not being bound to some religion. No, being a Christian is freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have freedom. Think about this, two thoughts. We have freedom because we know Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? Amen. We have freedom because we know Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And in John 14, verse 6, uh, we know what the Lord said when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the truth. Amen. He is the truth. And so if you know the truth, you'll be made free. We have freedom. Think about it like this. Freedom even to walk around through the fire because we know Jesus Christ. And then number two, we have confidence because we know Jesus Christ. 
I think that verse in Romans 8, verse 28, when it says, and we know that all things uh, work together for good to them that love God. We know that because we've got confidence. You know, when you use that terminology, when you say, I, I know uh, something is true, you, you are saying, you're giving a testimony that you've got confidence in the fact. Amen? You've got confidence in that truth. You've got confidence that that thing is true, that it is real. And, and so uh, it, there's a confidence that we can have because we know Jesus Christ and when we're walking with Him as these three are in the fiery furnace. Notice with me in 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, Again, what, what is a familiar passage of Scripture to us, uh, beginning with verse 11, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. This is talking about assurance of salvation. This is talking about the fact that we know that we have eternal life. You know, the thing about it is, there is no such thing in the Bible as a hope so or a think so or a maybe so salvation. You don't find that in the Bible. There are people, if you ask them, well, are, are you saved? Do you know that if you, that if you were to die that you would uh, be in heaven? And how many times does somebody ask that, that question? And maybe the answer is given, well, I sure hope so. Or you ask somebody, are, are you planning to go to heaven? Well, I, I hope I can make it. I hope I can get there. The problem with that is there's no Bible to it. Uh, there's no scripture that backs up that, that thought or that answer. You cannot answer and have scripture to back it up to say that, well, I, I, I think I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, be in heaven. I, I, I hope that I'm saved. Uh, I, I think that, that, uh, that I'll be all right when, when it comes to the end. There is nothing like that in the Bible at all. The Bible only teaches very plainly a no-so salvation, that you have to know it. And so that's what it says here. Uh, these things have been written unto you, verse 13, that believe on the name of the Son of God. There's, there's where it begins. You have to believe on the name of the Son of God. And it says that you may know that you have eternal life. Not, not that you can attain it or that you can get to it, but that you can have it right here and right now. It's like what Jesus says in uh, uh, John chapter 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that hath sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You see, the Bible tells us that the moment uh, that you experience salvation, the moment that you call upon the name of the Lord, the moment that you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, eternity begins right then and there. Salvation life begins right then and there. Now let me back up and say this. Uh, eternity, uh, really it does not just begin there, but eternal life does begin there. Every one of us, every person that's ever been born is going to spend eternity Every, every, every individual in this earth was made, was created to live forever because we've been created in the image of God. And in the, in the image of God, as God is a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, man has been created as a triune with, with, with body and soul and spirit. And so man is a, has a soul and man has a spirit. And the Bible teaches us that the soul and the spirit of man are eternal things. Uh, they're not temporal things. The body is temporal. The body will one day ultimately be put in the ground or the body may be uh, burned up. But the Word of God tells us that we'll have a new body. Amen. We'll have a new body uh, in eternity. But the thing about it is, a man's soul or a man's spirit is going to live forever somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. There's going to be an eternity. But Jesus says, listen, if you'll hear my words, and, and then implied there would be believe the words, believe the gospel message. Hear my words, believe God that sent the Son, God the Father that sent the Son to be the sacrifice uh, for us on the cross of Calvary. If you'll believe that and receive that, 
you will have eternal life beginning right at that moment. You'll, your name's written down in glory. You will have a home in heaven. There is no hoping so or thinking so or maybe so about any of that. There's only a no so about it. You can know that you have eternal life. And so this is assurance of salvation. Now, in 1 John chapter 5, you have to back up and understand too, as he said, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. This life is in his son. And so there's a key here. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And so there, there it is. You either have the Son of God or you don't have the Son of God. Either, either you're saved or you're not saved. If you're saved, you have the Son of God. And having the Son of God, you have eternal life. And so you have assurance. But you know what else you've got? You've got confidence. And that assurance really just spills over into confidence. We can have assurance of salvation. We can have confidence in prayer and confidence in our relationship with God. I really think Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they were not afraid of that furnace because they had confidence that God would hear their prayer and that the Lord would deliver them. Uh, verse 14 of 1 John chapter 5, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. And you can have the confidence uh, when it comes to salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says there's a note of confidence right there. And look down, if you're looking at 1 John 5, look down to verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come. That's the gospel. We read it of his coming to the earth as the babe in Bethlehem, walking in uh, Israel in Judea, the shores of Galilee, calling his disciples together, uh, preaching and healing people of their diseases and their troubles, and, and, and then going to the cross and shedding his blood and, and dying uh, on my behalf and on your behalf. We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And you notice something interesting here, the very last verse of what John says here. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Isn't that what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? They kept themselves from idols, didn't they? They kept themselves from idols, they had confidence that the Lord would uh, deliver them. Even if it meant to be in the midst of the fire, they weren't worried about it at all. They weren't bothered with it at all. Here we see them with this new sense of freedom uh, because they know God. They're walking around loose in the fire and the Lord is walking with them. They have a new sense of freedom. And that happens when you know that you're saved when you know you've trusted Christ as your Savior, there's a new sense of freedom. But then there's also a new sense of fellowship. And they had that as well. A new sense of fellowship. Verse 25 again, uh, uh, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God a new sense of fellowship to go along with their new sense of freedom. For you see, the Bible says here, there is a fourth man in the fire. Amen. There's a fourth man in the fire. They were cast out by the earthly king Nebuchadnezzar, but they were then brought into sweet communion with the Son of God, even though it was in the midst of a fiery furnace, they were, they were at fellowship and they were in, at, in the presence of, of the Lord God Almighty, amen, right there in that furnace of fire. You reminds us of some things in the New Testament that we, that we read about the Apostle Paul. If you would like to look there with me, let's begin by looking at Acts chapter number 16. Acts chapter number 16. And uh, in Acts chapter number 16, uh, here we have Paul and, and, uh, and Silas, and, and uh, they're in Philippi. They're going to be arrested. They're going to be put in, in jail. And, and uh, well, let's just read, some, read it in verse 22 of Acts 16. Acts 16, verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, 
charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast uh, in the stocks. And so there they are, not only in prison, they're, they're in the inner prison. It's like they're on the back row. They're, they're at the back end of it. There, if you could think of your mind as they're like in a, in a dungeon type of thing. Uh, there's other cells, there's other prisoners that are there, but they're at the very back of the lot there. And, uh, and it says at midnight, verse 25 in Acts 16, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's uh, bands uh, were, were loosed. And he says, And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, uh, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. They, they, they had the opportunity to flee, but they didn't do it. They, they were there. But you see, even in the midst of their prison, even in the midst of that midnight in their lives, even in the midst of that inner prison, they have freedom. They had freedom to uh, worship, to sing praises uh, to the Lord. They had freedom to have a prayer meeting. They had fellowship together. And when the jailer come in and, he, and just supposing that, that surely as soon as that earthquake came and those gates were open that, that these prisoners would have been uh, uh, would have would have fled out and the reason that he pulled his sword and would have killed himself is because of the charge that he had been given by his supervisors it really tells us that 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 evidently uh, Paul and Silas were on death row because in that day it was a common thing that a Roman uh, guard of a prison, when he was given charge of the uh, certain prisoners, that charge to that Roman uh, soldier would mean that if they get away, that whatever their penalty is, you're going to get. And so uh, evidently their penalty was going to be death. And he was ready just to go ahead and take his own life. But Paul says, hold on, son. He said, we're still here. We're not going anywhere. We're having a good time down here. We're having church. We're having a prayer meeting. The Bible says all the prisoners heard them. And uh, it's a wonderful thing that takes place here. The Philippian jailer, he gets saved. The people of his household get saved. It doesn't say, but I, I, think, I think it would be easy enough to suppose here that a good number of those other prisoners probably got saved too, amen, before Paul and, and Silas left out of uh, that place. And so you see this new source of fellowship. Paul and Silas in that prison but you know, before they left, they had a new brother in Christ. <laughs> Man, they had that Philippian jailer. They had his family. Uh, they had a new fellowship along with a new freedom there. But then also about the Apostle Paul, there is 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And here the Apostle Paul is writing while he is in uh, prison once again. He's under a house arrest in, in the city of Rome. And he writes to uh, Timothy uh, concerning this time and in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and pick up with verse 16 uh, Paul said this at my first answer no man stood with me but all men forsook me I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul recognized here this new fellowship uh, with the Lord uh, as Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they, they understood it there in that fiery furnace. Not only a new freedom, but a new fellowship as well. Paul said, everybody else has left me. There's nobody else with me now during his imprisonment. But he says, one thing I know for sure, and that is the Lord has never left me. And he says, I know that the Lord never will leave me. And by the way, we have that same promise uh, this evening. He says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
He'll be with us always, even unto the uh, end of the world. He'll always be there. There will always, listen, when it comes to God's purpose in our life through salvation in Jesus Christ, we will always have this sense of freedom. We will always have this uh, source of fellowship. But then not only that, when it comes to the fiery furnace, and, and listen, we can look at this, this idea of this fiery furnace as maybe, uh, maybe a picture, if you will, of some of the trials that we face in this life. And, and they can be fiery trials. Uh, they can be pictured here like being cast into this uh, fiery furnace. We may even think of this time we're going in now with the coronavirus pandemic and, and then the political scene in America and, and uh, we don't know what the economy is going to be like in the days ahead. You know, we're living in extremely uncertain times right now. I don't think there's any of us can really say for sure what's going to be going on in America in the next uh, several uh, weeks or, or months or throughout the rest of this year and the next year. But we have surely had a fiery furnace of trial uh, in our life uh, in this past year, in the year 2020. But think about this with me, because that's what we have pictured here with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And understand this. Everything that God has given us in the Bible, he gives, it for, he gives it for our good, and He gives it for our help. And so the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there's a purpose to it in helping us in facing some of the fiery trials that we may have to face in this life. And we can understand that uh, by God's purpose, as Romans 8, 28 again, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. That by God's purpose, we, we have freedom. By God's purpose, we have fellowship, and we have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as with one another, with brothers and sisters in the Lord. But we also will have a new opportunity for service. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found that. They had a new opportunity for service. Back in Daniel chapter 3, you, you see how that Nebuchadnezzar, he, he, he goes to the furnace, he calls them out, he brings them out. They find out that they, they don't even smell like they've been in the fire of all things. They don't, don't even smell like it. Their hair's not singed. Their clothing is not burned. The only thing that's gone that, that's gone was their was their was their 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 bindings, uh, the the ropes or whatever they used to tie them up and to bound them. Well, that was gone. Why? Because they had freedom. Amen. They had that sense of freedom and that fellowship uh, with the Lord even in the midst of the fire. And so that's gone. But if you drop down to verse number thirty, look at what happens here. It says, "Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province." of Babylon. You see what they've got now? They've gone through the fire. They've gone through the furnace. They went through it because they believed that, that whatever the case, it's all going to work out good. Whether we get delivered out of the fire, whether we die in the fire, it doesn't matter. It'll all work out good because we're believing it's going to be according to God's purpose. It's going to be according to, to God's will. And so they have for them now a new opportunity for service. They've been promoted. They, they've been given uh, higher jobs. They've been, uh, uh, really, that, that phrase there where it says they've been promoted, uh, it means they, they've been made to prosper. Uh, they've got some blessings out of this. They got blessings out of the trial and, uh, and a new opportunity of service in a new position there in Babylon. You see, the thing about it is their influence was greatly enlarged after their trial. Now it's all because they obeyed God, amen? But their influence was enlarged. Can't you imagine this? From here on out, all the people there in Babylon, where they, when they would see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, couldn't you just hear the people say, hey, you know, you know who them are? That's some guys that, that's some guys they throwed in the fire. That's some guys that, that came out of that fire. That's the ones that Nebuchadnezzar gave this high job to because their God delivered them out of that fiery furnace. They had, a, they had an even larger influence upon the people there because of their confidence in God, their faith in the Lord, and their trust in Him. 
to refuse to disobey God's commandments. They'd be like the apostles in the New Testament said we ought to obey God rather than men. They would not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's idol. They would not, uh, they would not burn in Nebuchadnezzar's fire. Amen. <laughs> they, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't bow down and they wouldn't burn. And just imagine the testimony and the influence they would have had. And again, all because of this thing. They simply obeyed God. You and I are facing fiery furnace now. In this time we're living in, in this, in this year, we have truly been facing a, a fiery furnace of trial. If we will also obey God and, and just be confident and have our assurance in Him, if we'll just obey the Lord and, and know that whatever the case, it's all going to work out good. It's all going to end up for God's glory anyway. Even, even if it means that we're to leave this life, if we know Jesus as our Savior, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. And so can I just say to us this evening, church, it's all going to be good. Amen. It's all good. And, but we must obey and let God, let God enlarge our influence as well. Come out of this fiery trial with an even stronger witness and, and, and bolder testimony for the Lord. In John chapter 14, and verse 21, Jesus said this, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. That phrase there when he said, I will manifest myself to him. You understand what that means. In simple terms, it means I will reveal myself to him or I will show myself to him. Isn't that what he did in Daniel chapter three? When they would refuse to conform to Babylon and bow to that idol, uh, when they heard that music, they cast into that fiery furnace and, uh, and they just obeyed the commandments of God. They would not bow down to that idol. And what did Jesus do? I believe he loved them, but he also very definitely manifested himself to them. And you see, the promise is still for us also that if we will obey his word and, and listen, if we will show our love to him by our obedience to him, if we'll keep his commandments, evidence of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ, he said he'll love us. He said we'll be loved of the Father. And he says, I will love him and will manifest myself to him, we can have that, that new sense of freedom, that new sense source of, we can know that source of fellowship and we can, and we can have uh, that greater opportunities to serve the Lord and be an influence for him and a witness for him. We, we can have uh, so much more than we could ever even uh, think of or dream of. Because you see, he's going to show himself to us. He said, I'll manifest myself to you. I'll walk with you in the fire. I'll, I'll be there with you. You're not going to go through it alone. He said, I'll go through that fire with you. And I don't know about you, but the thing about it is, if we can concentrate on that, that ought to give us ample confidence to get through a, a coronavirus pandemic. Amen. That will give us great assurance to get through a economic upheaval or, or political turnover or change in America, whatever we'll be facing. You see, the thing about it is, uh, listen, the, the, the presidential race and the, the Congress and, and all the things that, that we have and that we've, we've prayed about and, and of course we're concerned about. But understand this and don't forget it. The president of the United States, no matter who he is, he's not your king. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is your King. Amen. The President is not your Lord. Jesus Christ is your Lord. Amen. And He is the one we stand for and we stand with. And He has already promised us that as we will do that, no matter what the trial, He says, I'll stand with you, even in the fire. I like that. There's a fourth man walking 
in the fire. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together. Our heads bowed, our eyes closed for prayer. We'll prepare to have a song together. And as we do, just a word to those that may be uh, catching the message by way of the, of the YouTube or the Facebook or the audio message on the website. Uh, friend, let me ask you, do you know that freedom and that fellowship that you can have in the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, the promise is still for us today. If we'll believe on Him and trust Him and be saved, even, even, even if, as it were, we're walking in a fiery furnace, He'll be there with you. And you can have that if by faith you'll just trust Him. If you've not done that, our prayer at Grace Baptist Church is that you would. And that'll be our prayer for you tonight. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you for the example that we see here of these three in, in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. And for that wonderful thing of that fourth man walking in the fire, we know it's you, Lord. We know it's you. And Lord, as you were with them in their fiery furnace trial, you also have promised to be with us if we'll just obey your word and live for you. You've promised us you'll love us you'll, uh, as we would love you. You would love us. You would manifest yourself to us. We can have confidence. We can have assurance. We can, we can know that it'll all work out to good because we love you, Lord, and our desire is to follow your purpose for our lives. Lord, help us to always do that. Lord, we pray for those that may be uh, watching by uh, the message on the internet. If there's one that gets a hold of this message, they've never been saved, and they recognize that they're facing some fiery trials. Lord, we pray that they would indeed uh, come to that place of conviction and faith and call upon you to trust you to be Savior and Lord of their lives. And Lord, then you'll be in that, in that trial with them. And you'll help them and they'll have that peace that passeth understanding. Lord, we'll just thank you for that and we'll give you the praise together this evening. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Let's we'll sing a song together, Brother Tim. Page 278.